So I wanted to start by you know, giving you just this quote. I'm sure most of you have uh, heard before that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And that is really to dive into, you know, begin to try and unpick, you know, what exactly is innovation to begin with. And there's a very common error uh, that I think is found in everybody's thinking. Um, firstly, it's important to note that innovation is always the child of freedom that it is fundamentally about exchange of ideas and it's fundamentally about collective intelligence. So your own ideas are often triggered by others and the way in which an idea comes around is almost always evolutionary and it is not one of invention alone. And disruption, importantly, you know, we often talk about disruptive startups and disrupting any um, system. It's never a singular event in time but it's rather iterative over time. And that's important to remember because I think often in the echo chambers in which we operate, whether it's Silicon Valley or whether it's you know, where you are today in Munich, you know, those uh, echo chambers can often effectively lead one to think that you know, disruption is an immediate moment. You know, we only see the big successes of any startup, it's breakthrough you know, when it fundamentally transforms the industry or area in which it's operating. But in reality, there's been a series of iterations um, prior to that point. Um, and this is where we come to this distinction primarily between invention and innovation. Invention is not innovation, right? Invention is a new prototype. Invention is a new social concept. But innovation is the proliferation of that idea in the market and the adoption and acceptance of that idea that ultimately leads to, uh, to systemic change in any one area. And that's very, very important because obviously it, you know, for a lot of the people you know, listening in today, you'll be at the very early stages of forming your concepts, forming your ideas, and you might get too tethered to that one eureka moment, to the moment of invention. And you might to some extent feel like that is the solution in of itself. And it's very important when it comes to creating team cultures and when it comes to evolving over time and finding your market fit to make sure that that error is not made. So I want to tell a story. I think, you know, if you're going to be inspirational, how better to do it than necessarily by telling somebody else's story. And I should say at this point, you know, that almost everything I know today has been through a series of learning from other people's experiences, as well as my own. And a lot of certainly on this topic, you know, my own thinking has been formed by the likes of George Gilder, Astro Teller at Google X or, or Matt Ridley, all of whom I recommend that you read. Uh, and I'm happy to share a reading list after this. Um, but let's start with Norman. So he is a great and too often forgotten hero of the 20th century. And what this man effectively did was developed short straw, high yield varieties of dwarf wheat, which effectively kicked off the green revolution in the subcontinent and turned India from a country on the edge of famine into a net exporter of wheat. You know, but where did he get his ideas from is the question. You know, and how did he suddenly come upon this Eureka moment? Well, to begin with, what's important to note is that Ultimately, he may have developed the solution, but it took a number of geneticists in India and a number of you know, politicians and market makers to ultimately prove and deliver his idea uh, into that market. Um, but at the same time, you know, the idea itself, he was building, as we say, on the shoulders of giants, you know, that he had picked up the idea from a uh, while in conversation with a, a fellow colleague in the space at a bar in a conference in Argentina, and they had heard it from someone in Japan and so on and so on, right? And we can track that, uh, where that idea originated from and how it evolved and the, the, the groups of people involved in collaborating around that idea to ultimately bring it to market. And this is truly innovation because it is transformational, as I say, systemic change in that today, we hardly use, even in wheat production today, we almost don't use more uh, land than we did 50 years ago. And that's entirely down to innovation of this kind. 
So, you know, how does this innovation come around? Well, as I said, that really important word of, of team, right? And that idea of, of collective exchange of intelligence. You know, often with a startup, you'll find there are founders who, who may, you know, have had the idea and all too often cling onto it. I often say the best leadership in companies are those who continually replace themselves with people who are better than themselves in certain areas. And I think the same is true of an idea that ultimately when it comes to the exchange and proliferation of that idea, it's about sharing it and allowing others to take it and run with it in allowing others to introduce new iterations of that idea. And this is where we come down to the old, old concepts of collective intelligence, right? We are all nodes in a network. So if you kind of pull back for a second and you think about humanity's key achievements, it's never been an individual intelligence. We tend to think of you know, these giants, we tend to think of uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee and the creation of the internet, you know, the Wilbur brothers and the creation of the airplane, you know, these single individuals and moments. But almost always those ideas actually resulted as a phenomenon of networking or division of labor. You know, this is something Matt Ridley goes into a lot which is that ideas having sex, right? The exchange um, of those ideas. And more often than not, it's very interesting to note that these moments in innovation will occur in certain ecosystems. So for the last 50 years, that has been California. Before that, it was Victorian Britain. Before that, it was the Florentine Renaissance. And before that, it was ancient Greece. And more often, you know, the, the environment that best enabled that was not just one that allowed that freedom of exchange in terms of ideas, and that often manifested itself in trading, but also fundamentally in the correlation between advances in technology and the connected population sizes that were congregating around that. One I interesting idea though I want to leave you with is obviously that of the distributed human brain. Um, and this can actually apply to the day-to-day -day of how you create, a, uh, come up with an idea, build a team around it, create a startup uh, and go scale. Um, that is that in the 20th and 21st centuries, we've seen with high-speed transportation, telecommunication, uh, telecommunications and the internet, ease of communication, ease of movement change dramatically. And what's interesting is that certainly now today, you know, it could be argued that the next Silicon Valley, certainly when it comes to digital innovation, is in the cloud. It's more difficult, obviously, when applied to manufacturing or physical infrastructure. But when it comes to coordination or networking communication, already today, you know, here we are on a Zoom uh, 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 call, exchanging information, right? And that can happen from any place, anywhere in the world. So if you take that down and ask yourself the question of how do I build uh, innovation processes into my iteration um, around, you know, the idea that I'm building my startup on, well, you know, no longer necessarily do we have to limit ourselves simply to uh, containing a team within a single room in order to do that, that brings certain advantages. But at the same time, we can rely on this massive distributed intelligence um, that is now available to us. And I think, one other point that I will layer on top of this is, as you know, as I referred to before, you know, this idea of cities and concentrations of populations. You know, the ideas of how we scale have also changed dramatically over time. One of the most recent discoveries by the physicist Jeffrey Rest, a remarkable discovery, was that cities scale according to a predictable mathematical formula, one in which you can also apply um, to events in nature as much in business. And this, you know, he calls this the power law. Now, ultimately what this means is that as the population of a city scales, you have superlinear and sublinear um, growth in infrastructure or social drivers. So as the city grows, you don't need so many petrol stations. You don't need so many subway systems. You don't need uh, so many power lines. But as the city grows, you get the super linear line, which is that actually the social drivers, the thought exchange, the, uh, the amount of literature being written, the amount of plays being produced, uh, the amount of startups proliferating ultimately within those cities also tends to exponentially increase in the super linear rate. 
to the population level. And the reason this is important is because ultimately, you know, what this also means from a, a, a sort of sustainability or efficiency standpoint, that the greater the concentration uh, of any single given intelligence, the greater the speed of iteration to some extent, due, driven by exchange, driven by incentive, uh, driven by um, uh, the ability for one solution to learn from another, but that also we require less infrastructure. I would try you know, to leave you all maybe with a thought to take away, which is that question of, if we return to the last slide, if we now assume that we are moving into a more distributed age, not just in terms of financial exchanges that we've seen in the crypto world, not just in the digital ways in which we communicate and network, but maybe even in the ways that we live, that has very interesting implications for the kind of solutions that we're building for the world and also the ways in which teams can work and, and ideas can be allowed to proliferate. To give you an example of that, you know, certainly what we think about, right, as investors into the supply chain, we've seen as a result of COVID a fragmentation of, first, of supply chains in the first mile. We've seen the emergence of robotics and automation and 3D printing and other industrial technologies. And we continually ask ourselves questions like, does this mean reshoring or nearshoring production? Does this mean that suddenly the producer of a good can actually get that much closer to the consumer? Does the concentration of the consumer change and in, in, in they actually distribute more uh, across any single given geography rather than concentrate in single city, mega city clusters? You know, and what does that mean therefore for how we're able to build sustainable infrastructure for the manufacture production and delivery of goods um, in and in response to those trends? Um, now, these are not, you know, we have answers to some of those questions and we don't have answers to other ones, but that's how we take, you know, this kind of breadth of thinking and start to try to boil it down into macro trends and then ultimately into the kind of micro of the thesis driven investments that we're making in the questions of where we allocate our capital. Because more than anything else, we look to back real engineers and real kind of change makers, transformational uh, founders um, in, in, in whatever given system or part of the market into which we're investing. And that requires you to continually not only learn from the past as we have done from observing how ideas like dwarf wheat came to proliferate in the market. You know, that question of timing, why did the electric car having been invented in the late 19th century take until the early 20th century to actually proliferate? You know, you can take those learnings and apply them forward uh, to understand what we need to invest into today. So what does this mean from a more practical standpoint in terms of how you and your teams actually think about building and iterating your products? Because every one of you, whether you're in the ideation phase or building that MVP or creating that first market fit or even getting on into kind of scaling into that market, will continually be iterating and innovating. Um, we take a lot when we think of that early ideation phase, where often it's most challenging and most important, is those ideas formed by Astro Teller in the Google Moonshot factory, um, which is very much, you know, my, my firm belief is, you know, you learn from others. Uh, and if you don't think you can beat it, use it. Um, and this is really all about failing fast and emphasizing around kill factors and learning what good failure is but basing that always on rigorous research that can then allow this kind of weird creativity, as we call it, or serendipitous discovery. Because if one thing is true of innovation more than anything else, it is that it always stems from chance. There's a randomness to it, but you can build cultures and you can build teams that can allow that. So, Think of a checklist, right, or in terms of your innovation culture. One important element is the question of, and, and the must, is to avoid the path of least resistance. 
human nature is to try to solve the easiest problem first. You know, what can I build today? Let's put the bad thing or the hard thing off until tomorrow, right? The best thing, in fact, to do is to tackle your biggest challenges first. Because if you can't solve it, if you cannot find a fix or a patch, you have to pivot. But in having tried to solve it, you will have learned 10 other things. And from those 10 other things, you may have created an entirely new idea or learned something about the existing idea that can allow you to ad adapt it or evolve. The second thing is you need to do that well, you need to incentivize good failure. And firstly, you know, what do I mean by good failure? That is that anybody, you know, if I were to try and build a bridge, I'm not a trained engineer, it would probably fall down. That's not good failure. Good failure is where, you know, those people with the best skills applied to a particular problem and the fit to the particular problem have been unable to or proven that it's unable to be solved in one or another particular way. And this can be very difficult to build into cultures, particularly when we're all programmed to get the pat on the back. We're all programmed to succeed. And more often than not, we will therefore try to drive and force success even when faced with clear reason to fail or change. And so how you incentivize your teams to fail well is a very important factor. Um, the other element is this 10X over 10% mindset. We all have limitations on resources, right? And when you are a small team with limited resources, you need to rethink the quantity over quality approach. And instead of viewing everything as a nail, you know, we try to understand how the perfect nail will look like in the future and determine what components are currently lacking to produce it. Because in doing that, you can determine what is best available to you and work within those resources rather than wasting time pursuing uh, any kind of direction or development um, iteration that ultimately uh, you're unable to fulfill by virtue of the limited resources to you within a given set of time. And the last is what I uh, mentioned before, which is that allowing for chance, right? Creativity can only stem from rigorous learning and exchange and cultures that ex uh, encourage that knowledge sharing or open feedback loops, both internally and externally, and accept that great ideas can come from anywhere will avoid the trap of getting too fixated on, on one particular idea and will allow for the chance that another iteration of that idea or an entirely new one could come from anywhere and to open up those feedback loops um, to encourage that. Thank you.